All right, welcome everybody to the February 21st, 2012 meeting. I call the meeting to order at 7.02 p.m. And we're honored to have the Shakopee Cub Scout Pack number two nine, uh, 619, sorry guys, to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance today. for coming and thank you uh, Tyler Tyler great job doing the flag <laughs> Camera. <laughs> Mark you got it backwards thanks guys thank you so much thank you that was great all right, moving on to item number three, approval of the agenda. Uh, Mr. Mayor, you should do roll call. Oh, roll call. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Councilor Whiting? Here. Councilor Clay? Here. Councilor Lehman? Here. Councilor Punt? Here. Mayor Tapke? Here. Thank you very much, and thank mm -hmm. you for the reminder. Sorry about that. I was so excited about them doing the pledge. <laughs> <No>. All right. <laughs> um, item number three, approval of the agenda. Any additions or corrections to the agenda? Uh, the staff has done, Mr. Mayor. Anyone from council? I'll move to approve the agenda. Second. Seconded by Councilor Whiting. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Item number four, consent business. Are there any items to uh, remove from consent agenda this evening? How about add? Or add to consent agenda? Is there reason why F1 and F2 couldn't be on consent? F1 and F2? Oh, 10 F1. It's <laughs> like F1. Oh, sorry. Um, no, you're going to want to take two off or leave two on. I, mean. I would like to leave both of them off the consent agenda simply because I think community deserves to know about them and have discussion. Okay. Anyone else? That's why. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you. by <coughs> Councilor Lehman. We read now. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Item 4A1 declares two vehicles held by the Shakopee Police Department to be surplus property and authorizes proper disposal through au auction. 4A2 adopts a resolution approving a grant <coughs> agreement with the Minnesota Department of Public Safety for the Southwest Metro Drug Task Force for calendar year 2012. 4B1 adopts a resolution approving the final plan of Dean Lake's 8th edition. 4C1 declares outdated and obsolete equipment held by the Shakopee uh, Public Works Department to be surplus equipment and authorizes proper disposal through auction. 4C2 authorizes a joint powers agreement for 2012 street maintenance work such as traffic markings, crack sealing, and seal coating. 4D1 approves the promotion of current employee Carmela Nassine, Office Service Worker and Administration to the position of Engineering Secretary at Grade 3, Step B of the 2012 Non-Union Pay Plan, effective February 27, 2012. 4E1 authorizes a new two-year agreement with Royal Vending for beverage and snack vending services at the City's Park and Recreation Facilities. 4E2 adopts a resolution authorizing the City to submit an outdoor recreation grant program application for the construction of a picnic shelter park warming facility within Riverside Fields Park and such a public hearing for March 6 to consider the construction of the facility. 4F1 authorizes bills and pass-throughs to be paid in amount totaling $1,397,815.84. 4F2 approves minutes of the February 8, 2012 City Council meeting. And 4F3 approves expenditures of up to $20,000 for needed furnishing at City Hall focusing primarily on office spaces on second floor. All right, thank you very much. Is there any discussion on those items? All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 
Anyone opposed? Passes five to nothing. Thank you, <coughs> unanimously, I should say. Uh, item number five, recognition of involved citizens by city council. Anybody out there have anything you'd like to talk about that's not on the agenda? All right. Item number six, I need a motion, correct? Public hearing? Open a public hearing, that's correct. I need a motion to open a public hearing. Councilor Lehman? Make a motion to open a public hearing. Second. Second by Councilor Clay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, we are now in public hearing unanimously. Item number six, public hearing on proposed vacation of easement south of 4th Avenue and west of Canterbury Road. Resolution number 7168. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Um, as you've noted, it was a request for vacation of an easement within Opus MBW in anticipation of the Sandmar project. Um, as staff uh, got into preparing its report for this evening last week, we went to the source recorded document, that number that was provided to us, looked at the document, and found in that document that there was an easement created between two private companies and a specific provision that uh, indicated there was to be no public easement. So we contacted the surveyor who had done the work for the applicant and asked them if we might have gotten the wrong document number. They provided the document that they relied on. Um, and it was the same document. So we have at this point concluded that there is in fact no public easement or public interest either um, in that easement area that's indicated on the exhibit in your original report um, or in a pipe which exists there. Apparently that pipe is also private as well. So it will be up to the property owner, seller, and developer of that roughly 45 acre parcel to determine what to do with that pipe in terms of storm drainage because it is located roughly through the middle of the proposed Sandmar building. Um, so what we suggest as staff this evening is that you uh, see if there is anyone who wishes to speak to this issue, close the public hearing if there isn't, and simply take no action this evening. All right, thank you Mr. Leake. Anyone in the audience like to uh, have the floor on public hearing? All right. Councilor Lehman? Motion to close public hearing. Second. Seconded by Councilor Whiting. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Meeting, uh, public hearing is closed unanimously. Item number seven, there was no, um, there were no items removed, consent agenda. Item number eight, recess for public development authority meeting. Have a motion to recess to public development? So moved. Sorry, I said that wrong. Economic, Economic development. development. Thank you. Economic I'll second that. Second by Councilor Whiting. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? We are recessed for economic development. Mr. Clay. Thank you. We'll open the February 21st, 2012 Economic Development Authority meeting. Uh, would you please make note of the roll for me? First, next item on the would be approval of the agenda. And seeing nothing on the table, is there anything staff needs to bring forward? No changes. Nothing changes. Mr. Layman. Motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. Seconded by Ms. Punt. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Agenda is approved. Next item would be the consent agenda. Uh, which I believe only has the approval of the minutes for January 7th, 2012. Um, Go ahead. We'll approve the consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Seconded by Mr. Lehman. He beat you to it. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda is approved. Item number four would be to accept the resignation of Rochelle Schulstead from the EDAC and direct staff accordingly. Well, there's any formal presentation for that. Just a motion to accept the resignation with regrets. Mr. Whiting. I'll move to accept the resignation with regrets of Rochelle. And seconded by? I'll second out with a friendly, friendly amendment. Sure, go ahead. To direct staff to fill the vacant vacancy created. Is that okay with the motion maker? Is this part of our uh, plan that we've been, I think she's on the list that we'll be presenting there next week. So. 
Oh. No, that's fine. Yeah. We'll okay. Go, yeah. So I have a motion to accept the resignation and direct staff to proceed with filling the empty spot that she leaves. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Item number five is a request of Trident for senior housing tax increment financing. Looks like Mr. Leak is going to lead us off. Did I hide the back or the uh, item on the right side? I'm not getting a an image. Oh, that's okay. And I've got it on the computer. But there's no image coming up. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Thanks. <coughs> Um, thank you, members of the board. I'm going to do a brief overview um, of this project, and we have two representatives from Trident, Scott O'Brien and Roger Fink, in the audience with us, and they're available to answer questions about the project as well. Uh, just a short PowerPoint to talk about the project. This is, as you know, a request for tax increment financing. Unlike those projects that you may be familiar with here in the city of Shakopee, it's a request related to a proposed housing project, specifically a 79-unit senior housing project with independent <coughs> assisted living and memory care living units. Um, it's proposed to be located on three of 10 acres that is adjacent to the Sachs campus here in Shakopee. Building size is projected to be about 83,000 square feet. The project costs um, are indicated uh, below land acquisition, about three quarters of a million. Site development, about 355,000. Construction, 6.1 million. And total project costs, about 11.7 million. Um, this is a request for housing TIF. And so it is not subject to the same criteria um, as would be a request for economic development assistance for a new business under our business subsidy policy or for creation of an economic development district. However, uh, we did both for the EDAC and this evening indicate to you what the approximate employment that uh, the project proposer anticipates would be in this facility. Um, about 31.5 FTEs or full-time equivalent positions because of the nature of um, this kind of facility, many of them may be part-time, um, and they can speak to that. It's a little difficult to tell on the front end how many folks would work in their positions full-time, how many part-time. The request is for TIF um, of about $1 million over a 20-year term. And I alluded to the criteria. This is information that Steve Bubel from Kennedy and Graven talked about in some more detail before the Economic Development Advisory Committee. But in the request, in a request for assistance um, in the form of TIF for housing, the criteria is really, is there a demonstrated need for that type of housing in the community? Will the proposed project um, address the identified need for housing? And if the assistance is provided, then the project must either provide 20% of the units to be occupied by persons with no more than 50% of the median income or 40% occupied by persons with no more than 60% of the median income. Um, part of your packet this evening, and it was shared with the EDAC, <coughs> is the need study that was done by the applicant in preparation for the development of their proposal. Um, earlier today, I shared some information 
um, that I believe we shared with the mayor, I'm not sure if it was shared with the other council members, about projected need as identified in Scott County CDA's December 2011 housing needs assessment for Scott County, which does address the individual communities as well. So the request before you this evening is uh, whether or not to move ahead with the development <coughs> of a TIF plan to provide assistance for this project. And I might note, if after your discussion, um, you choose to go ahead, in addition to the requested action that's a part of, of the report, uh, I would ask that you also make um, or give direction to city staff to proceed with the setting of a public hearing of a TIF plan. In your report, I've outlined the steps that lead to uh, the holding of a public hearing and final action on a TIF plan by the EDA and City Council. I should note that this evening it's appearing on both the EDA and the City Council's agenda, first at the EDA because the EDA would make a recommendation uh, to the City Council later this evening on what the final action should be on this. Excuse me, cough drops continuously. Um, I wanted to uh, point out one additional thing that's a part of your report and was only touched on at the EDAC. And that is that this is a project that proposes 79 units on three acres, part of a 10 acre parcel right now that's zoned to ag preservation. Um, the density of that number of units is not addressed specifically in any of our zoning codes nor is this type of use directly addressed. Um, licensed nursing um, home facilities are addressed in our zoning code, but this is a, a somewhat different animal than that in zoning terms. So if you were to decide to uh, proceed with assistance for the project, uh, then we will have to begin looking with the city attorney, with the planning commission on what the potential alternatives are to address that land use question. To date with the applicant, we've talked about whether or not there's a potential to do a PUD. Um, I don't know that we want to do a PUD on three acres, but if there's a way of doing a PUD for either the larger 10 acre parcel or the entire 30 acre campus that currently includes the school, that might be something we uh, could talk about. But I want you to be aware that simply moving ahead with the project, whether it's given assistance in the form of TIF or not, is not really the end of the story. We have a very significant zoning challenge uh, to address once that determination is made by the EDA and the City Council. So with that, if you have questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. As I indicated, the two gentlemen are here from Trident to also answer your questions about their project proposal. Questions for staff? Mr. Tabke. Mr. Lee, could you go over really quickly for people watching and everybody that <clears throat> what tax increment financing is and just real quick how it works so people understand what's happening? Um, very briefly, tax increment financing is a mechanism allowed by statute in which um, essentially the city um, can provide um, assistance in the form of the annual additional increment that's generated by new development. So there's a base valuation for the property that's established and for some period of time, depends on what the length of that district is, um, as long as the development plan, the TIF plan, and the agreements that relate to it and their objectives are met, generally speaking, TIF is provided in a pay-as-you-go form so that the developer is reimbursed um, that portion for some period of time. And at the end of that TIF district term, then whatever appreciation and valuation um, there is on the property is available to the city, the county, and the school district. Um, you've got a council member who probably knows this much better than I do because of the work he does. Um, an important thing to know about tax increment financing as opposed to tax abatement, which is something you, that you will be hearing about <coughs> in one of your upcoming meetings, um, is that in the case of TIF, um, it mandatorily involves the city, the county, and school district portion of the tax um, generated by that increase in valuation from the development. With tax abatement, the city can abate taxes under an agreement. The county can. Uh, the school district is not typically involved in tax abatement. So it's a very key difference. 
I don't know if the city attorney has anything to add, but that's a brief summary of how it works. Thank you. Other questions for staff? Thank you. Oh, uh, just a question, quick question, mm -hmm. Mr. Leak. Um, how is the city doing as far as its comp plan, <coughs> getting uh, this level of uh, low income housing for this kind of demographic? Well, the city's housing chapter in the adopted 2030 comprehensive plan has a goal of providing affordable housing, but it doesn't establish any numerical goals. And that's one of the reasons why I looked to that housing needs assessment that was done by the Scott CDA and off the top of my head. Um, right now, in terms of senior housing, we have about 104 units of subsidized senior housing. The vast majority of those are in Levy Drive apartments, that's subsidized housing. We also have a facility called Emerald Crest that provides memory care, about 38 units um, or um, spots for folks who need memory care in, in that facility. Um, the housing needs assessment for Shakopee indicates just in terms of senior rental, a need by 2020 of about 320 units and of those about 175 is the projected need for subsidized memory <coughs> care and assisted care facilities so as you can see right now uh, we have about 104 there's a projected need for about another 70 or so units within Shakopee alone and that's by the year by the year 2020 2020 which is only eight years away um, I think you just answered the one question I had. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lehman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, do, is the, let's see if I understand this. If we were to open a TIF district for this project, that would limit their ability in the open market by the percentage indicated. That's correct. If the city were to grant them TIF assistance um, under, I believe it's statutory, uh, there's a requirement that they meet one of those two standards, either 20% or 40% of the units be available um, to persons under some percentage of the metropolitan median income. Okay. Follow up. Mr. And Chair. that's, that is, if you will, the trade off for getting that assistance that it meets an additional need within the community. You have a follow, follow up, Chair. Um, does does that statutory requirement? Um, I guess what I'm getting at is if if Shakopee puts up this this type of money, is there any guarantees that it's our folks that are eligible for for this? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, so the EDA, uh, no. <laughs> I, I can double check with Mr. Buell, but I'm reasonably sure the answer to that question is you can't, you have to make it available. I mean, typically it's people in the general area. <coughs> you can't condition it on um, residents. Okay. And, and the, the same thing goes for if it's this were a TIF or a tax abatement request for a business, we can't mandate that. But their employees be from here, I understand. Yeah. So. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. The applicant would like to come up to the podium. Thank you. Thank you and good evening, Mr. Mayor, There's members of the City Council. There's a thing to sign up there somewhere, if you would, please. Of course. <clears throat> Take your time. We have a short agenda tonight. Is this the same one that I signed over here? <laughs> no, that's a different one. Okay. There'll be a third. But we, 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 che <laughs> <laughs> we, we check to make sure that the two names match. So. This way we're assured that your name will get spelled correctly in the newspaper. Well, then I better print legibly then. Ah. <laughs> yeah. uh, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council, my name is Roger Fink. I'm here tonight representing Trident Development, uh, the applicant for the TIF, uh, uh, the TIF request. <clears throat> um, certainly want to thank Mr. Leake. He did an excellent job in explaining uh, our application <coughs> and helping us with uh, direction and guidance uh, working through the process here. Um, I have a few prepared remarks and um, 
my associate Scott O'Brien is also here to help <coughs> answer questions when I'm done with those quick remarks. But I just wanted to emphasize a few primary points regarding our application and our development concept. <coughs> our request is to establish a 20-year tax increment financing district on the property as uh, Mr. Leake described. And the purpose of that is to create and maintain 12 affordable housing units for the elderly citizens who are in need of assisted living services. I think one of the distinct differences between that housing demand referenced in the um, housing study is I'm not sure that it addressed the elderly that need assistance <coughs> as well as just the senior housing requirement as well. Our assisted living facility will offer um, the affordable units in a <coughs> facility that's designed to bring assisted living services to those residents. That's in contrast with some of the other age-restricted properties that have been developed by um, Scott County around the area. So there's a distinct difference in the product type there. Um, Mr. Leake referenced a housing study. Uh, we too uh, author, authored, authorized, I should say, a uh, market study for the Shakopee um, market trade area in general, evaluated all the demographics, the recent census data, evaluated the competing properties and all the edge, age demographics in that market area. We also um, <coughs> categorized that dem demographic set based on their household income. And the purpose for doing that is for us to try to determine what is the unmet need for affordable units in addition to the need for market rate units. Our market study analysis indicates that um, there are somewhere between 90 and 100 households right in that Shakopee trade area that are going to need or currently need assisted living and won't have the financial resources to pay for it on a market rate basis. So they'll need to seek assisted living housing services um, somewhere um, where they can ob ob obtain some affordable rent or some subsidy. So that, we believe that demand exists right here in, uh, in Shakopee. <coughs> as far as our <coughs> TIF calculation amount, we have spent some time visiting with the Scott County Assessor, determining what the incremental tax increase is likely to be on the subject property as a result of our development. Um, in talking with uh, Scott County, and I think we worked with um, David Drown Associates as well to do a tax analysis and determine that the incremental increase over and above what the land taxes are likely to be now will be about $115,000 a year more. We are proposing to take 90% of that and roll that into the the captured tax increment that will be refunded through the TIF district over 20 years. When your present value of that, I think it comes out to be about $107,000, $108,000 a year back to the property, when your present value of that back comes to right around a million dollars. So that, that, I guess, substantiates the tax capacity of the property to support the amount of the TIF request. That makes sense. We've also done a cost analysis as to the eligible <coughs> costs of our development and um, we've concluded that the eligible costs involved in our project also match well uh, match up well with um, the amount of the request as well. Um, I think Mr. Leake touched on the new jobs aspect of our uh, development here which is kind of a plus when you come to approving a housing TIF. It's something you don't ordinarily get with an apartment complex but with assisted living that's a little bit unique in that there's those new jobs that come with it. I just, uh, in, in closing, I think I would just like to mention that we've successfully negotiated TIF districts with three other Minnesota cities in recent years, and we're um, eager to move ahead with the city of Shakopee to work with your, your legal counsel and your financial consultants 
to put together a solid um, tax increment agreement and uh, move forward with bringing this needed housing complex to Shakopee. Um, so with those brief remarks, I'm happy to try to answer any questions you might have, and Mr. O'Brien's here as well. Do you have any other things you want to add, Scott? Since, <coughs> since Chairperson Clay said it's a short agenda, I have 45 <laughs> minutes of prepared remarks here. Oh, I, I did it, didn't I? <laughs> um, I just want to touch on a couple things for those of you who aren't aware of um, <clears throat> how we put together one of these projects and who we are. Trident is the developer. Uh, an affiliate organization of ours will be the construction company that builds the facility. We, Roger and I and, a, and our associate, will be one of the owners of the facility long term. I'm from Shock before the record. I've lived here basically all my life. So um, that group, our group, will own a portion of the project, as will a firm out of Bloomington called Tealwood Management Company. Um, Tealwood Management manages facilities in South <coughs> Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska, and Minnesota. Collectively, they manage for their own account or for projects that we've developed and constructed with them or for municipalities such as the city of Lamberton, who the city actually owns the facility in that town, and they're not interested in managing it, so they hire a firm like Tealwood to manage it. So they will be our management partner. Um, recently, they actually own or the project up in Eden Prairie called The Colony. It's a 140-unit assisted living and transitional care facility. Um, I printed this off just for information's sake. The facility was recently named one of the top 39 nursing homes of 15,500 nursing homes in the country. So I just want to assure everybody that the project that we're bringing to town is going to be a first-rate project, and the folks that are going to manage this and take care of our residents, probably at some point my folks, are first-class operators. Um, I think that's, that's an important point for everybody to understand. One point of clarification, um, the TIF we're seeking is 20%, which is the equivalent of 16 units, I think Roger, Roger mentioned 12. Um, it's actually 16. And when we, when we speak about there being 100 residents currently seeking assistance, you think, oh my gosh, there's we should be building a l much larger facility, but what you have to keep in mind, I think, and is we, all those folks aren't ultimately going to end up in a, in a facility like ours. You know, some might move to Little Falls, some might move, end up in a nursing home, but some might end up in Arizona. So we look at that overall figure of 100, and it sounds huge, but no one facility is going to capture all those. So just for what it's worth, we're not going to look to build another 84 units. <coughs> anyway. um, I think that's all I can, oh, and one other thing, Maxfield Research was the firm that did our, I think that's part of your packet of material, so yep. for what it's worth, uh, this, the other markets, market research that was done wasn't done by us, it was done by an independent third party. So with that, I, I guess we would entertain questions. Questions for the applicants? I'll start down here. Uh, just a comment, uh, you mentioned uh, Little Falls, and my mother-in-law lives in one of those facilities, and it is a brings a quality of life and um, it's a very high quality uh, facility and I'm very happy that she's in it but, um, thank you is there a room for expansion if there was uh, a need there could you build on that property more <coughs> in, your, in your estimates yes what we're finding in the facilities that we've constructed recently we've we've underestimated the demand well we didn't underestimate we have a market study Okay, so a city and a bank are very interested in what that market study says, and they're probably not going to let you, they don't, we don't build beyond what the market study says. But from a enhanced services, which is what we call that secured memory wing, we're finding that those portions of our, pro of our projects are filling up almost immediately. Um, so <coughs> the thought would be if we needed to, that would be what we would expand and we would be able to add an additional building. Um, we have a facility in, that, we've, that we're going to start construction on in July in the southwest part of the state and in, in that specific facility rather than this X design that we have for the Shakopee facility, 
we have a separate wing, separate building. So we would look to add a separate building on at some point if we needed additional enhanced services, because that, it, it's, it's unfortunate, but it's a growing segment of the market. Thank you. Mr. Lehman? In the, let's see, if the, if resident, residency is allowed to lower income households utilizing the elderly waiver program, the total unit supported would increase. What is the elderly waiver program? The elderly waiver program is, is a, it's a Medicaid program. Um, the manner in which it works, does this thing, this projector works, correct? Um, yeah. High tech help, maybe. It might be easier for, yeah, I'm, if oh, you put it up ahead. so it faces you, yep. Terrific. Okay. So these, these are, this is <coughs> illustrative. It's not exact, but with our market information that we've gleaned to date, we, we're estimating that these might be the average market rate for assisted living apartments with services, $3,245. The elderly weaver program, the state of Minnesota sets the rent that you can charge for a unit. Last year was $846. This year it's $876. It doesn't matter what county you're in. If you're in Cook County or Washington County, that's the rate. Then once that resident comes in, Services, a service package is negotiated with the county you're in. So assisted living isn't brand new, but it's different than the old nurse, than the nursing home model, which was where, you know, the person, the, the county had a nursing home and that's where you went and the rate was the rate. Here, <coughs> for this example, and this is just kind of, this 876 is exact, that's what the current state uh, room rate is, then you project your service package revenue, fifteen hundred dollars. You negotiate that, and the reason it's estimated is um, you might have additional needs that Mr. Whiting might not have. So our staff and the county work together to determine what that service package ultimately is, and that's kind of about where we're ballparking things that's our some counties are a little more generous than others and but on an average that's about where we come in so then you see what that difference figure ultimately ends up being then when we go to enhanced care services which <coughs> is your traditional memory wing um, you see what market might be the same uh, 876 applies to those units and then the service package ultimately is the acuity level is higher for those residents, so that service package ends up being larger. Um, but the difference also ends up being larger. So that's what the elderly waiver program is. Ms. So you've talked about the different type of living units. Um, are there any other amenities or common areas? Oh, yeah. Um, Describe. Yeah, let's just put that up there for a second. Okay. In this facility, which is what differentiates it from a standard CDA or HRA type subsidized housing, which is apartments, um, we have a full commercial kitchen. So those residents are receiving meals, three meals a day. We have in this facility, what we're going to do is we're gonna put in um, a full spa. So we're gonna have a pedicure station, <coughs> a massage station, and then a uh, hair salon. Um, this facility right here is in St. Michael. I probably am in there once every 10 days. The busiest room in the whole building is always that salon. Those beehive things that you put over your head, there's always four or five residents in there and three or four others talking. Here's so. That. We have, wh what we're gonna do in Shakopee is we're gonna make that facility or that, that amenity, it is in St. Michael as well. It's open to the public. Um, you're not gonna go up there probably to get your hair done, but none of us probably in this room, but the, the, the resident of Shakopee who's 75, whose best friend who's 86, who's living there, 
they're more than welcome to come up and, and spa together or whatever. So then we have, of course, a community room, just like any other facility would have. We have a chapel. Um, we have, in this facility, we'll have some tuck under garages. We will have, uh, what else are we going to put in there? <coughs> the, library and the library and the lounge. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then activity center. So it's a full spectrum of activities. What most of the residents in these facilities are looking for and what they need is socialization, security, and nutrition. That's why they're coming to these types of facilities. We also have an RN on staff all the time. Um, in the memory wing, the staffing ratio is 1 to 7, 24 hours a day. So these people are... You know, everybody, all the residents are, are well, cared for, well cared for, and there's always something going on. Because this is where we had an associate that is the CFO of the management company was going to come today because this is his area of expertise. Um, he fell ill. He called me like an hour ago and said, I, I, I just can't <coughs> make it. So I said, well, I'll punt and try and <laughs> cover things as best I can. But... From the science perspective and the healthcare perspective, uh, Tealwood does it. Well, I mean, they're not number 39 out of 15,500 because they're slouchy at the way they do things. They are great at taking care of these residents. The other thing we're going to incorporate into this facility in Shockby that we don't have in St. Michael is now that the new changes are coming to the Medicaid, Medicare, and healthcare laws, we're working with hospital and, and uh, St. Gertz we're going to put in an examination station here so that if a resident goes out and has their hip done or their knee done, they can come back and we can bring services into the facility for them, house calls, old-fashioned house calls, in our exam room. And then, you know, whether it's Alina or Park, they can come in and, and help rehab those people. So it, it's something we haven't done, but the whole... <coughs> emphasis with the new health care I mean we built that before the health care thing came down so now we're realizing we need to offer that um, because it's it's great for the residents to not to have to leave and incidentally the residents don't drive typically um, and we have a bus so if they need to go somewhere we take them or typically they'll have uh, somebody from town bring them to wherever they're going to go. Because when we opened this facility in St. Michael, the citizens of St. Michael were north of us and south of us. And when we opened this, they came back. Because the 84 to 88-year-old person that grew up in Shakopee or that grew up in St. Michael or Little Falls, they, they, they want to be with that same set of friends, and they just they want to be in their, their hometown. So they typically have somebody to help them get around. But in Delano... We have 51 units, and we own, there's only three owned the cars, so they don't drive much. Mr. Tabke. No, I don't have any additional questions. I was going to ask about <coughs> traffic and parking, but you just <coughs> answered those yeah. since it's in residential area and we need to be mindful of the intent that way. I should allude to that. Thank you. We, this isn't atypical. The situation where we're in front of an EDA and a city council asking for um, some TIF assistance and um, some zoning changes at the same time because a lot of municipalities don't have zoning for this project. If they do, they haven't gotten an application, so they haven't thought through the parking. So they, they adopt the parking ratios that they have for apartments, which is two or two and a half or 175 to one, you know, two cars per one unit. Well, we need to go in right away and say, nobody drives a car. We don't want all that parking out there. It's just, why have it? So typically what we do is we work with the city to find out, okay, how many full-time employee equivalents are we going to have? How many guests do we typically have? <coughs> and then come up with a, a smaller parking ratio, usually 0.65 to 0.8 to one. Thank you. There's, there's not a lot of traffic. I have a question or two. The, um, wh why this particular location? Oh, that's a great question. Um, that, 
that leads back to part of the healthcare aspect that Tia was so good at uh, assisting us with, and part of that is site selection. So residents want to be in a location that's close to church or worship. Doesn't have to be the denomination that they belong to. Activity, school, and in a residential setting. Um, when we look at this in a total, uh, uh, the, the campus like <coughs> feel that we're ultimately going to hopefully achieve within the next 20, 25 years, that, that part of it, I'm not going to make a guess as to when ultimately the three Catholic parishes in town perhaps might build a church there someday. Um, we're going to have the chapel there anyhow. Um, but what Tewood and the industry has found is the best location for these facilities is in a residential setting that's close to worship. It's not close to worship because they're walking to church. It's not close to, say, a hospital because they're walking to the hospital. In Winona, we have a facility under construction. Actually, it's very similar to this one, and it's very similar to the one we're going to do here, hopefully. It, it's right across the street from the hospital, but nobody will walk there. Everybody will get in the bus and go to the hospital, but it's that comfort feeling that they have the ability to go to the hospital, that the hospital's right across from them, that the church, is, the church here in St. Michael is right near the facility. They can't, nobody walks to it, but it's right there. And that's what these, it doesn't, it, like I said, <coughs> it, the de denomination of the, if they're a Lutheran or a Presbyterian or whatever other denomination, even Jewish, they don't care. They just, it's the comfort feeling of being near um, a worship and being in a residential setting. I'm guessing that looking at your um, your need studies and then the county's need study that this project would work even if it, you didn't get any TIF for affordable housing aspect of it you could still make it go as just all market rent yes most likely so in, in some municipalities we can't we absolutely it just because of the demographics it's not going to happen in this specific instance we're making an application to enter into basically a public private partnership with the city to say we'll earmark 20 percent of the units knowing that the financial impact to us is significant <coughs> if the city will assist us with the TIF package and that we've done that in a couple municipalities where we have had significant demand market demand in the interest of full disclosure though I will add this if we have a resident who comes in and exhausts their resources and needs to go on the elderly waiver program that resident will not be asked to leave so they the typical stay in one of these facilities right now the average age of our census is 86 Typical stay is 32 months. That's the average because they die or they have to go to that's nursing right. home. I didn't, or, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's um, Mr. 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 Judge, just clarification for something that uh, Mr. O'Brien had said earlier. Um, there has not been an official application for a zoning change at this point. You wanted to see whether the financial assistance was going to be forthcoming before that was submitted, correct? That's right. We have it. Just, it sounded as though there, that was also being considered <coughs> this time. Just to clarify for folks who might be watching, that would be a separate consideration. Zoning changes. Correct. Okay. okay. You guys want to do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain procedures. We <laughs> have to follow hey, Thank you. I have to Rules. do some publishing of <clears throat> the. Uh, so it sounds like at this point in the proje project, if it, if it occurs, we are probably on one A, step one A. Um, the whole. It sounds like the majority of the uh, 
questions we're going to have as far as whether or not council or the DA or later the council decides to proceed with this is is whether or not we want to um, want to promote the affordable housing aspect of this project it would be the driving decision making force behind offering TIF or not um, and the requested action I think at this point is would be to direct Staff. This, the suggested action would be for the EDA to make a recommendation to whether to proceed with the development of, of a TIF plan and the setting of a public hearing on that TIF plan should you decide to move <coughs> forward with it. So we're not making anything and we do tonight is not saying we're approving TIF. It's only saying that we're approving it, you starting are, a process to get more information about it and have the public hearings and and, and continue studying the issues. You would be forward. directing your staff and your consultants, both the city attorney and the financial consultants, to develop a specific plan for this TIF district uh, and to circulate that to the school district and to the county for review and comment, um, to bring it back to you for a public hearing and for you to take action on after you've held the public hearing. So, so none of that binds us to any no, nothing we would be doing tonight would be binding us to a, on a future decision. We're just saying let's get a plan developed and bring it back and study it more closely, right? I may ask the city attorney to weigh in on the question because I think it's a little nuanced. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the the um, the answer to that question is yeah, yes or no. Nothing that you do is going <laughs> to bind you. It's yes uh -oh. or no. Okay. But having said that what the applicant is asking is really for the council to make a policy decision tonight that you'd support you know a, a tax increment assistance for an affordable project like this and so it does give them general direction to proceed and incur expenses so it's it's a policy issue so as a matter of policy if the eda and the council doesn't want to do that you really should tell the applicant that tonight so they don't proceed with all those expenses but now that this you're not binding yourself to any level of increment uh you know the, you know, the, the economics may come back and for all, you know may show that they don't need any assistance but if the study comes back and shows that there is a need at some level at this stage you are saying as a matter of policy we support providing tax increment assistance uh, at least willing to consider um, tax increment assistance for a project like this so there is some representations you're making but you are not binding yourselves to you know any specific plan approval rezoning or anything tonight. Mr. Lane. Mr. Chairman I'm I'm kind of hesitant because I'm hesitant to, to have a tip for this project and I'll tell you why your 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 reputation is stellar your the the product that you offer is is outstanding the market is there I think this whole project it can can take off without limiting yourself and, and and my concern is if you have 44 out of almost 50 percent taken up by uh, elderly uh, waiver folks or those uh, under an agreement that you're really limiting your your ability and I think you've got a great product and I, I don't think you need to be limited and I, actually I think you'd probably do better without it um, at least I guess that argument can be made so Mr. Whiting well, I think uh, on a different level that this is offering a quality end-of-life experience or uh, people that need that that service to people that can't afford it and I think that adds uh, a quality of life here in Shakopee that I would like to see but they have a program for that already but th this kind of uh, building that they th that I'm familiar with up in Little Falls is something I would want you know my parents and in your parents and everyone's parents to be able to be part of but you can get an el uh, elderly waiver for that 
but if they're selling it at market value, they may not make that. They may not have that opportunity. Okay. That I think their, what that would be their decision. I think. Yes, but if I may, I think what Mr. Whiting is alluding to is, but for TIF, if you're correct, and we can fill the building with market rate folks, you're you're right. A smart person would. I, I'm bringing it back to why we're here in the first place, and that is for the same reason that Mr. Whiting brought it up, we know there are residents here that need it. We want to help provide it. We want to enter into this public-private partnership in order for us to do it. If we can't, it doesn't make sense for us to do it. That said, we'll never, we'll never ask anybody to leave if they need to be on it at some point. But up front, if we're under a TIF agreement, they're this thick, and I have to leave units empty and not rent them to market folks, not that I'm going to probably have this issue here in town, if they're not affordable. I have to meet that covenant all the time. And I think what we're doing is saying, and I don't think, we are doing this. We are saying we will earmark those units for the assistance, but for the assistance, we don't earmark those units. May I just add a I think it's been a good corporate too. citizen. I think that the city's comprehensive plan clearly lays out a goal and objective for the city to encourage and support all types of housing options for the residents here, especially housing uh, units <coughs> that are affordable. It helps foster and promote affordable housing options for the elderly and other citizens here in town. What this development brings as an opportunity to the city is to help the city create and maintain some affordable rental units, especially for the elderly and especially for those elderly who need some assistance with daily living, products that aren't being offered here now. And so together, we can help the city achieve some of those housing objectives, be able to offer housing options to the elderly of Shakopee who might not otherwise be able to afford it. Our, our proposal is a 20% of the entire project at 16 units out of 79. We think that's a manageable level and is something that uh, serves both the city and the developer quite well. Mr. Tabke. Um, with the Low income housing. I agree with Councilor Layman that um, low income rental units, I should say, uh, that this project could probably fly on its own, and there's a lot of need out there, and there's a lot of um, demand for this type of unit within Shakopee throughout the campaign and talking to people. There were a lot of people who spoke about exactly this type of community in Shakopee, and I think that there is a great need for this to happen. Um, but along with that, I think it is incumbent upon us to make sure to take care of this segment of the population and do everything we can to keep them in Shakopee with um, facilities like this. And we have the demand shows that there is a need for uh, low income senior rental units in the town. That need will continue to grow and it will continue to expand. We're not going to have a lot of opportunities like this to get this type of housing in Shakopee and I think that we need to um, take advantage of uh, getting the low income rental units for seniors because there are, is, like I said, there's a lot of need out there and um, I think it's important to our community. If I may, that's seniors that require assistance. Shakopee provides senior through the CDA. We're already, I just want the folks Thank you. that are watching to make sure that they know that you know these these are people that can't care for themselves they can't they can't be living alone right. for a whole for a whole host of reasons this type of need I should say exactly specific because it's different than what is out there any other questions or comments from the commissioners Mr. White. I'll offer a motion directing city staff and city's financial consultants to proceed with the development of a TIF plan for the proposed senior housing project I'll second that. 
Made by Mr. Whiting, seconded by Mr. Tamke. Discussion? Mr. Mr. Chair, just a clarification, that's actually a recommendation to the City Council. The City level. Council. And, yeah. it, and it would include uh, authorizing staff to schedule a public hearing on the TIF plan. Did you get that? I'll, I will add that to the motion. <clears throat> that's the motion made and seconded. Discussion? I know it's not that. <laughs> discussion, discussion. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries four to one with Mr. Lehman in dissent. Thank you. Hang on, yep. Excuse me just a minute. Just want to make sure you understand we do appreciate all the effort and time and consideration you put into this application. I look forward to being in front of the council in the future to move that forward. So thanks again. Is there anything else to come before the commission tonight? Mr. Lehman. Motion to adjourn. To Motion Tuesday. to adjourn to Tuesday, March 6th. Tuesday, March 6th. Second <coughs> that. Seconded by Mr. Whiting. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. We are adjourned. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councilor Clay. We reconvene City Council meeting at 8.02. And moving on to item number 10B1, request of Trident for senior housing tax increment financing. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, as you discussed, sitting as the EDA, you have in front of you a recommendation from the EDA uh, to direct staff and its consultants to proceed with the development of a TIF plan to provide tax increment financing to the proposed 79 unit senior housing complex and directing staff to set the public hearing on that TIF plan. So the action asked of you is to uh, actually direct staff and its consultants uh, to develop that plan and <coughs> set the public hearing um, for consideration of the plan once it's developed. All right, thank you, Mr. Leek. I'll entertain a motion. Mr. I'll move to direct staff to prepare and, and develop a uh, Tax increment financing plan reflecting the recommendations of, uh, made by the EDAC or EDA. <coughs> uh, also, to uh, have staff set a public hearing for that consideration. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Councilor Whiting. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Passes four to one with Councilor Layman in dissent. All right, item number 10B2. Refinancing of CDA bonds for Northridge Apartments Project, resolution number 7169. Mr. Mayor and Council, the city has been requested by the Scott County uh, Community Development Authority to take action regarding the refinancing of approximately $6.5 million in general obligation bonds that were used to finance construction of Northridge Apartments. Uh, the bonds were initially issued in 2003 and were used to construct the 58 unit building, which is approximately two blocks north of City Hall along Levy Drive. That is occupied by uh, people who are 55 and older. By refinancing the bonds, uh, they're able to take advantage of some <coughs> lower interest rates, which therefore reduces the project's monthly uh, income needs. You as a city council or previous city council actually in order to facilitate this project did agree to provide the full faith and backing of the city's <coughs> resources should the project revenues fall short. Um, they have not done that. How, and by going with a lower interest rate, this actually then reduces some of the liability that the city might have on this particular uh, proposal. That's to the city's advantage. Um, if you are in favor of this, there is a resolution that authorizes uh, the city's refunding uh, portion of this and also that it renews the full faith uh, backing that was made initially in 2003. Are there questions or comments? Councilor Layman. Mayor, it wasn't, it's not a refunding. That's what you just said, a refunding? It's, Re refinancing. it's refinancing, correct. They call it refunding. Okay. And in the original agreement from 2003, the city <coughs> was listed as the second 
on the property, I believe, which means that if if we had to use the full backing of the city's cr credit to prop this up, we could potentially get that property, basically. We would be second in line, as I recall, yep. on it, and it would be only if there was a uh, default or something. The, through a default, that's correct. And after the uh, primary lender was repaid, if there's anything left, then that would go to the city. Again, that's my recollection. Does that change at all in this? Nothing, as I understand, would change in terms of the initial agreement on that. It's just that it's going to be back in <coughs> a reduced interest rate bond. Okay. Any other questions? All right, I entertain a motion. Councilor Lehman. Make a motion to approve the refinancing of Northridge as proposed. It would be to adopt resolution number 7169. 7169. I'll move resolution 7169. <clears throat> Approving the issuance of Scott County Community Development Agency and its government refunding bonds. Beautiful. Second? Second. Same way, Councilor Clay. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. No, thank you. Yeah, okay. we'll go there. All right, so 10 numbers, uh, item 10 C1. Um, 17 and Veerling Drive intersection improvement project. Mr. Loney. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, bringing back this item we've discussed before. It's on the screen here. We, we, we have applied for highway safety improvement funds and obtained a $1.1 million a grant, federal funds for intersection improvement yeah. for Veerling Drive which is this road here and Marshall Road, which is the main county road here. Also improvements to the intersection of the North U.S. Highway 169 ramp and this intersection. Um, we went to, we brought this issue back to council um, on December 6th, go out for request for proposals. You approved that. We went out for proposals. We did receive four of them from four consultants. Three of them are, are city consultants and one was from the county we did review those proposals and uh, the, of the team of two representatives from the county and two from the city staff <coughs> we are recommending Bolton and Mink would be the engineering firm selected for this project uh, for your discussion and approval we have a cooperative agreement with Scott County for this project and also an extension agreement with Bolton and Mink to proceed with engineering design services um, just to show you the project and get a little more detail, descriptions for everyone here. Again, we're going to be looking at this quarter, which is 17, looking at these intersections, how to best do this project, looking at some alternatives. Bolton and Mink was selected. They did have some innovative approaches to the project. They also looked at having a significant number more um, meetings with the state, county, business community, and the city to develop these, the final alternative to bring back for eventually construction. Part of the city, uh, and we also initiated a pavement rehabilitation of Burling Drive in this area, just uh, west of the signal all the way to Miller Street. So that's also included, but that would be a separate city project. The uh, Bolton and Mink proposal has engineering services not to exceed $176,649. If we do need right away acquisition services or construction engineering services, we'll bring back a separate agreement back to the city council for that. With funding for this project, we have $1.1 million from the feds as a safety <coughs> improvement project grant. The rest of the project cost per the county agreement would be split 50-50 between the city and the, the county. And that would include the local 10% local construction match, 100% right away, 100% engineering. The uh, pavement rehabilitation costs of Burling Drive that I mentioned 
earlier, it would be 100% city cost paid out of our capital improvement fund. Um, so with that, I would ask the city council to approve a motion to authorize the appropriate city officials to execute the cooperative agreement with the county and the extension agreement with the Bolton Bank so we could proceed with the project design. We're anticipating the design would be in 2012. Any right-of-way acquisition would be 2013 with final approval by the state in 2014 and construction in 2014. With that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Filoni. Councilor Lehman. Mayor, did he say 100% right-of-way acquisition was the city's cost? No. The cost that would be 50-50 between the county and the city would be to 10% local construction act. The feds are going to pay 90% of the construction cost. 100% of the right-of-way cost, we have to pick up the city and county, but it would be 50-50. 100% of engineering is our cost, both city and county. But we will we'll split those costs. All the local costs will be split 50-50. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Loney, as part of this study and as this project, is it possible, and this is more economic development than transportation, but the entrance and exits to the vacant building on the uh, east side of Marshall Road, um, is it possible that we could look at any um, improvements to that because it's really difficult to get in and out of that development? And um, it might be more appealing to someone to move in there if we looked at ways where maybe working with a property owner, because I know that property has gone back to a bank and they're looking at um, doing things with it. So I don't know if it is so into the old mayor. No, into the old Kmart, Gold Gym, Rainbow, all that area. Those those entrances and exits there, which are kind of tough to get in and out of. Um, especially the two to the west. Um, oh, well, the, the center one's easy, but the west one going west on Veerling there is difficult to do. And I don't know if there's any way we can look at improvements to that, getting in and out of that parking lot with this study at all. Is that possible? Yeah, um, anything's possible. We certainly will look at the transportation, I mean, part of the study will get traffic counts, we'll get some topography, we'll be putting all this data together to look at the traffic flow. Where are, Where's the traffic going? Now, this is a big box that's empty right now, so that kind of, we're going to have to do some estimating of potential traffic uh, that would happen here. But we will look at these access points. I think one of the ones that we'll be looking at for sure is this right in right turn lane and the Walgreen that should be that was a, that was a weak moment in my tenure here but uh, <laughs> we probably should not allow that we should try to remove that maybe make the right turn over here by the street access we'll be looking at some of those things but uh, and how we can make the traffic flow better or what things would make some improvements both for the short term for this project and probably for a long-term look, I mean, maybe we don't remove that access or don't minimize the access or do anything with the access now, but looking 20 years later, maybe that would be a potential. So we will take an in-depth look at the traffic flow in this area and, and look at the alternatives. The main, the main reason for getting the safety grant is the number of accidents that are here. And part of it is the congestion that causes the accidents. Part of it is just there's so much traffic and how to deal with it. Right. So we'll be looking at all several. Part of the proposal is to require at least minimum three alternatives to be looked at for making improvements here. So we don't want to just lock into what we submitted. We, we also have to do some what's called the ICE control, intersection control evaluation in order to meet the MnDOT standards. So we're going to have to do that for the, both both of these intersections. Perfect. Thank you. Any other? Councilor Lehman. Does it make any sense if we're going a block or block and a half, two blocks north of 169 to, to at least go south to 17th Avenue? 
It, um, or is that a separate project with that, the further out to 42? I mean, we may come to that conclusion that we should do more, but we have limits on what our funding is. If we can determine that it would make some sense to make some improvements further to the south, we would have to get MnDOT involved and probably get a cooperative agreement of some extra funding. But that could be a possibility depending how our analysis in our, you know, the engineering analysis comes about. So the next, the next few months will be a critical phase in determining what are the alternatives, having the meetings with the stakeholders on this project. One big one will be the business community and uh, we'll be working with them and, and with the state and the county and the city. So we have a lot of people involved. Obviously I have to get state approval for this project. So they're gonna be involved. It's a county road going to have to get their approval and I, I am the lead manager on the projects for the city so we're, we're going to have to get a good consensus building here I do have to say one more thing I did put a revised cooperative agreement on your table there's just one sentence that was removed <coughs> and that's the one about the sunset date and then exhibit a was not in your packet <coughs> and that's a standard county uh, exhibit on the their policy for equal opportunity that's the only changes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Loney. Councilor Lehman. Mayor, I'll, uh, I'll move to authorize the appropriate city official to execute the cooperative, cooperative agreement for project SP 166-020-05, authorizing the funding for the project come from the Capital Improvement Fund, and also authorizing the city to execute an extension agreement with Bolton and Mink for engineering design services on the project. Do we have a second for that? Councilor Clay? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you much. Item 10F1, Memorandum of Understanding for Joint Review of Services with Shakopee, Midwalk, and Sioux Community, Prior Lake, and Scott County. Mr. Mayor and members of council, several weeks ago, representatives of those four jurisdictions met to talk about ways that we might be able to work more closely together on different issues that neighboring jurisdictions normally look at. We're talking about things such as transportation, environmental protection, fish and wildlife, utilities planning, and things such as that. Part of this was an outgrowth of the tribe's most recent fee to trust applications. But it was very clear that there was information which had not been readily passed back and forth. One of the things that came about as a result of that meeting was an opportunity to <coughs> uh, form what we we're initially talking about as a, an intergovernmental working group that would have representatives from each of the jurisdictions come together on a regular basis and talk about those particular items. Um, what we are looking at right now is modeled after another uh, intergovernmental agreement uh, from another part of the United States that involves a tribal government. As we're talking about this right now, we're suggesting that two representatives ultimately be appointed to this, um, whether that's uh, two staff members initially or a, an elected official in uh, a, an appointed official and then ta uh, staff could be assigned as needed depending on the type of uh, situation being discussed at that point. It would be advisory. There wouldn't be, for example, votes taken on it because of sovereignty issues and we understand that. However, we think that ultimately this would be a good opportunity for the four jurisdictions to form better uh, partnerships so that we can provide services more efficiently hopefully we'll have information so that in the future we may not have the same need to have negative comments on any future fee to trust issues if those questions have already been posed and answered so what I'm recommending to you tonight is that you authorize the city to execute this we would suggest initially that you have two staff members uh, attend this and that in the very near future after we see what the other jurisdictions are going to do, we'll come back to you and if there's a need to add or substitute an elected official, we would do that at that time. I would note that the Midewakanton Sioux uh, Business Council has already approved this. 
the city of Prior Lake is looking at it tonight and I understand it will be scheduled for Scott County at some point in the future. Do I have questions or comments? Otherwise, a motion right. would be in order. Yeah. Um, Mr. Lane? Make a motion to approve the mem memorandum of understanding between the Shakopee, Mittawakanton, Sioux, City of Shakopee, Prior Lake, and Scott County. I'd also appoint uh, City's Community Development Director and City Engineer representing Shakopee. For their signs. For their signs. Councilman Whiting? I'll second that. Any discussion? Councilman Layman? My rationale for my recommended appointments, Mayor, is that uh, in a lot of our discussion, it's the development side by side, not really connecting and knowing what we're doing. And I think from a community development standpoint, our, our director, Mr. Leak, is obviously the key guy for that but when it comes to transportation water runoff and and storm sewer issues like that obviously our engineers demand for that so that's the rationale behind my uh my thought process okay and then we'll be able to appoint in the future because it hasn't been decided yet between the group as to right elected officials because yep. yeah, yeah. we'll be okay probably still gonna want staff members there yeah staff member will definitely be there is that and I think that certainly makes sense, and I'll just for the record, we'll probably tag along to these things as well. So um, I think, though, initially the two recommendations that you have would be uh, very good. Beautiful. And I want to commend you, Mr. McNeil, and Mr. Leake, and everybody else who has been involved in this. This, You guys did a great job in um, moving this forward and getting this to where we're at right now, so thank you for that. It's partnership um, and leadership of, of all four jurisdictions that uh, should be looked at for that, so... Thank you for that comment. Yep, Whose great. idea was that anyway? You gonna go there? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you much. Item number <coughs> 10 F2, resolution of support for Racinos in Minnesota, resolution number 7171. Mr. Mayor, members of council, in January, you'll recall that Councilor Lehman had uh, under council concerns asked that the city consider a resolution of support for Racino legislation uh, at that time the consensus of the council was that you would wait until a bill had actually been introduced before you could uh, before you would look at that and consider endorsing or not uh, we were advised last Thursday that bills are introduced in both the Minnesota legislative houses uh, excuse me chambers the house and the Senate and a copy of the House bill was actually included in your packet. As you can see, there's a lot of technical language in that talking about how this would be set up. Of interest to Shakopee and Scott County, however, is the section that says, I'm quoting here, licensing, but meaning Canterbury, must annually remit 1% of the compensation it receives to the city and 1% to the county in which the licensee conducts racing. This is important to us in that there would be additional public safety and transportation expenses that could be seen if Racinos <coughs> become a reality in Minnesota. The last time that the city of Shakopee actually took a formal position on uh, Racino was in 2003. Since that time, it has uh, come and gone, but there's not been a, an action taken by uh, the city of Shakopee. You'll note the resolution before you tonight talks about Racinos, plural, because since 2003, a second fair mutual track running ACES has been uh, established in Columbus Township in the northern suburbs, and therefore whatever is approved for Canterbury would also be impacted there as well. As I understand it, the way that the bill is drafted right now is that a portion of the state's proceeds would go towards education. Of course, that would be up to the legislature to determine where that would go should, of course, this be approved. Racino does benefit the horse industry in Minnesota, but it also, in this case, enhances one of the major industries that you have here in Shakopee. Uh, we are asking that you take a position formally on this tonight. There is a draft resolution of support in your packet. Randy Sampson of Canterbury is here tonight <coughs> should you have any questions about the bill itself. Are there any questions for staff? 
Is Representative Beard still lead author on this? Has that changed at all, or is he? I will refer to Mr. Sampson on that. Mr. Sampson, come on up, and you can chat. And for the record, I'm the Randy Sampson. Uh, sign yep. in for me, please. Sign in, Randy Sampson. I'm the uh, president and CEO of Canterbury Park Holding Corporation here in Shakopee. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the answer to your question is in the uh, the bill that we just introduced in uh, this week. Uh, Representative uh, Pat Garofalo is our lead author. He's the chair of the Education Committee. Uh, Representative Beard is a author, is one of the co-authors of the of the legislation in the House, as is uh, Representative Biskins and Representative Kelby Woodard, who both you know represent other parts of Scott County. And in the Senate, our lead author is uh, Senator Senjum, the Ho the Senate Majority Leader, who has been our author on the bill in the past. And Claire Roebling is is one of the other uh, one of the other five co-authors so both of the we are very pleased to say that both of the Shakopee uh, legislative representatives are authoring on our bill if you uh, I, I will be real brief here I know mr. McNeil indicated you don't need a uh, uh, the whole the whole presentation on Racino. you know we have been here before and I and I do appreciate the opportunity to uh, address any questions, make a few brief comments, and and uh, and I certainly appreciate the uh, interest in considering the resolution that that's uh, in front of you, and it would be it would be much appreciated by you know Canterbury Park and the horse industry people and our legislative authors if we were able to get a a, uh, a show of support, you know, uh, action taken by the uh, city council would be much appreciated. I'll only really talk just briefly the, about the. The uh, process of the bill, I, I, you know, if if people have questions about the specifics of how Racino operates uh, and and benefits to the horse industry, I'd certainly be glad to answer that. But I, you know, I know you don't need to have a long uh, discussion about it. The uh, the bill, as I mentioned, we've got the the two authors. Uh, Mr. McNeil mentioned that the the use of the proceeds uh, is actually repayment of the school shift. So there, it is. Technically, it's in, it's in the education committee. It goes in under the umbrella of education, but it actually is not funding that goes to uh, pay for classroom. Uh, it is a repayment of the the shift that was made in the in the you know the last several sessions. And I won't go into the details again. But there's actually, if you look at the bill, it talks about a uh, you know there's a market value shift. Uh, not the it's not the uh, market value property tax issue which is controversial over there but there was an education property tax shift also and so when you see the language in there about the property tax it really isn't anything to do with property taxes itself it's the it's the school portion of property taxes that the s state has delayed payment to the school districts and it would be repaying that and then there's a s separate k-12 education shift so as I understand it there's several billion dollars of of shifting that's been done to help balance the budget, and, and this would accelerate the repayment of those of those amounts to the to the school districts. Um, as as always, there's a benefit in there for the horse industry, and and Mr. McNeil and, uh, mentioned the that we have always had a uh, portion dedicated to city and county, and believe that's important because there will be some costs, and it, and it's important that the city and county uh, you know receive the some compensation to be able to offset those costs. One other thing I would mention is that's an update. You know, if you if you look uh, in the bill introductions at the legislature, there's numerous Racino bills over there. We had some confusion uh, at the start, and and there were some legislators that wanted to. Uh, Representative Hackbarth, who's a great supporter of ours, still is very much uh, of the opinion that Racino is a way to pay for the. Uh, football state the Viking Stadium so he has has a bill uh, has introduced a bill that makes that connection uh, but the bill that we're focused on right now is the education bill with that I mentioned with uh, and we expect to have a hearing hopefully next week in the Senate Education Committee is the first location we expect to go to uh, but one of the reasons there was some a number of bills and some confusion is 
you know, with running aces, our, our you know, the, the other racetrack in the metro area, we were have for the past year had a difficult time reaching agreement with them on on the structure of the of uh, legislation, and so uh, their their interests are you know although we are on we all believe Racino is what is necessary to keep horse racing uh, in Minnesota and and uh, you know create a thriving uh, breeding industry in Minnesota. Uh, we had different views of how how the legislation should be drafted. I'm really pleased to say that last week we finally reached agreement, and so that's why there was an you know they had a bill in, we had a bill in, and now <coughs> we have a joint bill that we uh, made some changes based on our negotiations, and so that, that's one of the real positives that moving forward now we have one bill in the House and Senate that both racetracks and the horsemen groups are all behind and working together to try to. Pass. So that's at least a quick update on the status of the legislation. Uh, it has, you know, we've been working at it for a long time. We do believe that there's some, uh, certainly some support for the, the idea of paying back the school shift and, and hopefully we'll get an opportunity to get through some committees and, and get a vote on the floor this year, which we were unable to do last year. Perfect. Any questions for Mr. Sampson? All right, thank you very much thank for you. coming and talking to us, and thank you for everything Canterbury mm -hmm. does here in Shakopee. Yeah. It's great thank to have you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, any discussion or questions at all? Councilor Clay? Discussion. Um, on the resolution, there's I need a change to it so I can vote for it. Maybe I'm not quite sure, but the wording needs to be, it'd be the, the last whereas, where it currently says the city of Shakopee supports language which includes the designation of 1% of the Racino revenues to go to each host city and host county. I need to change that or somehow to say like however the city of Shakopee's support is contingent upon language that includes the designation of 1% Racino revenues. If we, if we don't get that 1% I don't want it because you know, we don't have I don't want that expense, you know, on our backs, so that the state can fund the payments and reneged on that is <coughs> to the school districts. Is there I agree. Yeah, Mr. Sure. Thompson, is that? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Madam Speaker, yes. Um, I think we can wordsmith this after, but basically, what you know, the city's you want to say, whereas the city of Shakopee uh, supports the legislation, provided that. There is a designation of one percent. Okay. And we can, we can, we can. If that's the, we can make that as a, an amendment now and go from there. Any discussion on that uh, amendment here? All right. Any other discussion, Council Layman? I move resolution seventy-one seventy-one as amended. The uh, amendment would be the last paragraph changes to the one percent designation as outlined by council and legal staff and move its adoption <coughs> do we have a second i'll second that councilor wedding any discussion councilor layman here i'd like to point out just for the record that uh not only does canterbury bring good things to the Horsing industry, but it also brings a lot of users to our service industry in, sh in town here being the hotels the restaurants and various other service entities um, They run a pretty decent security outfit which minimizes our call load and Since you're here, I'd like to just thank you for the years of good service that you've done out there uh, working with Shakopee Absolutely, anybody else have a discussion? All right seeing none all those in favor Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Resolution 7171 passes unanimously. Item 10F3, Ms. Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This agenda item um, is to give the council an overview of a proposed reorganization of some of our administrative staff positions here at the city. Um, the retirement and um, 
hiring of city employees is something that's regularly done on the council's consent agenda. However, this is not <coughs> our uh, typical retirement that we are facing. Judy Cox, the city's city clerk for 41 and a half years, is retiring at the end of March of this year. And um, we are going to miss her greatly in everything that she brings to the city organization. However, when you fill a position once every 40 some years, it's a good opportunity to take a look at it and <laughs> make sure we're getting it right for the next, for the next 40 years. Um, so city staff has been thinking for several months now of basically, you know, life after Judy and what are we going to do after Judy retires. So um, we do think we see an opportunity to do a little bit of a reorganization um, that will bring some added efficiencies and effectiveness to the way we structure the administrative side of our staff. The bottom line of that proposal is that rather than um, hiring a successor or promoting someone as a successor directly to Ms. Cox, staff is proposing that we merge the city clerk's office in with the finance department. Um, both are relatively small departments at this point. The finance department has the director and two other staff. The city clerk's office has a city clerk two other full-time staff and two part-time receptionists. So the proposal is that the two <coughs> departments be merged. Um, our existing deputy clerk and records clerk would be given some added responsibilities and have some of their more entry-level tasks taken over by a newly hired secretary for the department. In your packet was um, an organizational chart trying to graphically depict the proposed changes. This is what our structure looks like currently. Um, the city administrator at the helm and then the city's various departments across the top here. Um, the city clerk's office currently falls into the administration department. You can see the personnel in that department. This entire department is supported by um, one part-time clerical position. And the current finance department is the director, two staff positions, and they um, do not have cleric dedicated clerical support. Um, they also utilize the services of our part-time support in the admin department when necessary. The proposed new structure will <coughs> take the salary dollars that are currently dedicated to the city clerk's position and divide them up, allowing this combined finance clerk office to have a full-time secretarial position and for us to enhance <coughs> the existing part-time clerical position in administration to become a full-time position. Um, some other changes that are proposed along the way would be the movement of platting and developers agreement, which is currently handled by the community development department up to the point that it comes to the city council, then it's handed off to the city clerk's office for completion. Under the proposed new structure, those activities would be handled by Mr. Leak and his staff in community development from start to finish, providing a greater degree of continuity for those activities and hopefully some amount of streamlining. The proposal is um, budget neutral in terms of salary and benefit dollars. They would be reallocated to the organizational chart you see here, <coughs> but come in within our existing um, adopted budget for 2012. I'm happy to provide more detail if you like about job duties and tasks if you have a particular area of interest that you're wondering how we would handle under this new structure I'd be happy to try to answer that I can tell you that this is a um, unusual retirement in more ways than one not just for the duration of Ms. Cox services but she does carry a legally defined position. The city clerk is something that state statute defines and sets certain roles and responsibilities for. <coughs> so we'll have a little bit more than our normal acceptance of resignation and appointment of a new person. Um, if the council is comfortable with the city headed in this direction, the next steps would be to bring forward job descriptions and seek authorization from you to advertise those positions for the two clerical positions that would be coming out of this the administration department secretary and a position, even our part-time position is now vacant due to a promotion elsewhere on your agenda tonight, and the new finance clerk secretary. At the March 20th meeting, we would propose that the council accept um, Ms. Cox's resignation. We'll also um, do an acknowledgement of her service to the city at that time. At that time, it would be recommended that as the head of the newly combined department, uh, Julie Linehan, our finance director, be given the legal title of city clerk that gives her the authority to sign certain documents and 
carry out certain um, requirements of the city. It also requires an amendment to the city code um, and appointment by <coughs> resolution. That's different from other. Um, at future city council meetings, we would bring forward an updated uh, job descriptions for the deputy city clerk and the records clerk positions. We have a pretty good idea where those are going, but if you recall, you authorized a compensation study for all of city staff to be completed this year. We're just kicking that off on Thursday. And their job descriptions will get updated in that process, and it works into that. So. I don't know how much detail you're interested in. I'd be happy to answer any questions or provide more detail depending on what you're looking for. Do you have questions? Do we have to pay Julie any more money? I'll do, I'll do it oh. <laughs> you're so sweet. It's part of what the compensation study is to look at. Councilor Lehman. I would prefer we kept the finance director and the city clerk position separate. Okay. Why? Why? Because, to me, you can almost make the assumption that there's, at po some point, there's going to be a conflict. Well, actually, by state law, the duties of the city clerk that are set out in statute are um, administrative record keeping and financial. And our current city code and our current ordinance that appointed Ms. Cox city clerk specifically pulls out and delegates the financial duties of the city clerk to the finance director at the time, Mr. Voxlin. So we have separated the position here in the city of Shakopee, but by statute, it is a single role where it is defined as being done by one person. Um, we have delegated certain duties of the clerk to the finance director um, under our current structure. I, so. would, I would argue that a 40-year history proves that the way it's currently set up is very successful. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mignon. Council, um, I understand that. However, we're always looking for ways to do good things even better if we can. And it is not at all unusual for cities to have the title of clerk treasurer for that particular position. So um, we certainly wouldn't be blazing new territory. Councilor Punt? Um, my only concern in reviewing this plan when I read through it in my packet was in um, moving the city clerk position to um, a shared position with the finance director. Is that limiting the career path of someone who had the desire to move upward to the city clerk position? So that was what was going through mm -hmm. my head in terms of it. I mean, it's not a deal breaker, but I have a concern about that. That's a, a good question and one that had crossed our minds. Our um, deputy city clerk is, with recent retirements we had, will now be one of our top two or three most long-standing <coughs> employees and has held that deputy title for a significant period of time. Um, all of the staff in the clerk's office were interviewed by me prior to making coming up with this plan and making this recommendation. We have met with all of them. Um, I won't say that she wasn't looking to be city clerk. She has not expressed to me, given multiple opportunities, that frustration or that this doesn't seem to be playing out the way that she had expected or wanted. Um, all of the remaining staff in the clerk's office will be given some new and additional responsibilities and have some degree of change and shake up in their position, um, which we're hoping is something that people find exciting, although obviously it can also be somewhat um, intimidating or just new at the same time. But um, Mark, you look There seemed good. to be general level of support by all of them. Uh, there were some of the tasks which were not <coughs> going to be their responsibility any longer that um, they saw as positive. So I think generally speaking, the people that are most directly impacted by this are supportive of what's been proposed. Great. Uh, this was, am I correct in characterizing city clerk position as a bit of an antiquated position with cities the way they're run now? Not that anything that Judy does is antiquated by any means, but she does a lot of other things in addition to city clerk. It's there aren't many towns that have cities that have a city clerk position anymore, is that? No, I think it depends on the size of the city. You will definitely find city clerks in your smaller cities, especially in greater Minnesota. In some cases, they may be the only staff that a smaller city has would be <coughs> the city clerk. Mm -hmm. um, so comparable. Oh. 
Utah. Comparable cities, it's not at all like Mr. Um, McNeil mentioned. It's fairly common to find the job combined into something else. Legally, every city in Minnesota has a city clerk that fulfills this checklist of duties. Um, it's not uncommon to see it in the city manager's job. You'll see it in the assistant city manager's job. You'll see it in the finance director's job. Um, some cities have a director of administrative services, and then they, if you read through the fine print of their job description, they're the city clerk. To have it stand alone as we have it now, um, I would say we are in the minority, but I wouldn't go so far as to say it's rare. You can certainly find other cities that have it structured the way we do. Okay. Uh, and, and certainly what job duties are, are have grown as the city has grown. Perhaps the title needs to be looked at, and that's one of the things that the compensation plan will do. I will say, however, that bless her heart, Judy has been one of the most <coughs> faithful individuals when it comes to attending the myriad of night meetings that you have. Quite frankly, I don't know that that's the top priority of a lot of the folks that we have working during the day. But because of people like uh, Kim, who can, um, well, as you know, some of the uh, boards commissions don't physically have someone here because of streaming and because of technology now they can do a lot of the work remotely or, or at a later time. And so um, those are things that have changed over time and we just need to be able to adapt and, and adjust to the times as they are. Mr. Yes. Mayor, if I could, I think that question raises a good point that some may not be familiar with, especially if you're watching at home. The city clerk's office currently today manages all of the records of the city. So if you want to go back and find agenda items, minutes, contracts, agreements that the city has entered into, uh, city code um, sections that have been adopted, resolutions, all of that record keeping and historical knowledge of of things is done there. They um, manage the election process <coughs> for the city. Um, our current city clerk's office does licensing for things like alcohol um, and tobacco licensing. Um, monitor insurance, we make sure, for example, a contractor that comes in and rebuilds a road for the city is properly insured um, and make sure there's no liability for the city. Um, what am I missing here? That Those are big. Elections, licensing, and record keeping are probably the primary functions of the city clerk's office. And is this format that you've laid out is this what you think is the most efficient way for now and 30 years down the road when we have another person who's there for 40 years is that is this the best way to do it you know I'm not so brazen as to stand up here and say that this is going to work definitively for 30 years in our current structure with our current workloads and the variety of departments we have I believe this is the best approach for the city to take I think many of the functions of the clerk's office um, fit well within the finance um, department they're very they're highly regulated aspects of the city's very much policy procedure record keeping and data driven um, so I think that the types of, uh, of employees you're likely to attract to one department <coughs> and, and set of tasks mesh well with the other they make a logical grouping in my mind perfect all right any other questions Councilor Lehman yeah, I have another question since a lot of the city clerk function is direct public and uh, related I guess currently people come into the front desk city clerk comes out or whatever now it's gonna be up and down up and down the stairs because the city clerk should be upstairs or are they still gonna be downstairs no we would propose to combine the divisions into one physical space if they're sharing a single department head supervisor as well as this newly hired clerical staff to support the whole department we feel it's important to geographically locate that staff together. Um, you know, we can measure steps, but I, I don't believe that the distance from the second floor to the front desk is all that different than from over here. Um, and the employees that are being asked to make that move have not expressed any objection um, to the move. Typically, if someone's coming in for a licensing question or things like that, uh, staff will meet them here in the council chamber at the front desk, and that wouldn't change. Okay. All right, anything else? <coughs> Entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Punt. I will offer a motion to approve the merger of the city clerk's division into the finance department as outlined by Ms. Wilson. Do we have a second? Second. Councilor Clay, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone mm. opposed? Aye. <coughs> Councilor Layman opposes, passes four to one.
All right, item number 11, council members' reports. We will start on that end. Councilor Whiting. Well, thank you. Um, well, I attended the school board meeting, and uh, they were working on, uh, they approved a improvement project for Pearson's, the middle school, and the junior high from proceeds from their bond issue, their last bond issue. Uh, they are looking at a possible new school, high school site in the year 2017 and are thinking that 80 acres is something that they're going to need and that will not be according to them on their property they own on seven, County Road 78 and 79. Um, they have another plan for that. <coughs> so that kind of would be putting a referendum around 2013-2014. That's all I have to report. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clay. So much to report. The Utilities Commission meeting was tonight before this meeting. Um, the, the Utilities, Shagab Utilities and the Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association is the group they buy their power from, um, have received a grant from the Minnesota Division of Energy Resources to implement what's called smart grid technologies. And uh, it's going to be doing some uh, really interesting things with the uh, learning center that, that they're building up at the high school. Um, gener wind generation of power, photovoltaic power, and computerized ways of st you know, storing the, uh, the electricity that it generates at night or on an off-peak time and, some, and then being able to reuse it during higher peak demands. Uh, and they're also going to be looking at um, choosing a few uh, homes within the city to uh, apply the smart technology to the electrical power usages of the homes and then as sort of a, a training and an experimental thing to see how it, well it works and how much money is saved. <coughs> might, the, the things they learn from this might uh, be something that would wind up being um, promoted or around the rest of the country is if things work out the way they hope. Uh, there's still doing some uh, tree trimming around the power lines and stuff. So uh, one more reminder to folks, if you have a property or a large tree or something that seems to be or looks like it's going to be uh, uh, conflicting with a power line, either your service line or other power line in the area, you should you know give the utilities a call and they can get a, a, some people out to trim that back for you. Um, and then there was some discussion about uh, the utility commission decided uh, to go ahead and, and light the Home Street Bridge, um, kind of on their own. And they have been uh, having discussions with Mr. Loney and as well as people from the county trying to uh, <coughs> figure out a way as to you know, how we can come to an agreement as to who pays for how much of the, the lighting for that bridge. Um, when it was redone or upgraded, in order to stay true to their whatever they, rules they had to follow for a historical renovation, they had to put in lighting that was truer to that age of design but not very efficient by our standards. And we can't change that until the bridge is officially transferred over to Scott County's possession, which still hasn't been done yet because there's a triangle of land on the other side of the bridge that's owned by the DNR. and they need that before they can do the final transfer and they, the, the DNR cannot transfer land to anybody except MnDOT. So until the, the DNR gets their act together and transfers that thing, then the, the MnDOT can transfer it to the county. Don't ask problem. me to repeat that. Um, but that, that's going to be a discussion that we can anticipate coming up sometime in the next few months, I would guess. Uh, that should be it. Thank you. Councilor Lehman. Uh, 169 corridor coalition meeting. Um, the gist of the meeting, I guess, was the lack of connections between various service providers and other various service providers. Um, was it Jefferson bus lines? Was there? Correct. Yeah, they were in attendance with the overview of what they do and where they do it at. They basically have the center of the country from Texas up to Duluth and out a couple states. Um, see so if there's any opportunities for them to work within the various service providers in the area, which looks like there probably could be, probably benefit everybody involved. Um, the key, the key really is how do we get 
all these entities. It's it's kind of frustrating because you have various entities, all of which we taxpayers pay for some way, shape, or form, whether it's Southwest or Metro or, or our own. Um, yet they can't seem to work together collaboratively for the best interests of those that are paying for them. Uh, case in point, you can't take a Shockby bus to Eden Prairie and connect with an Eden Prairie Southwest bus and take it to somewhere else and just all these <coughs> little connections just need to need to happen and it's there's resistance from Big Brother up in the cities uh, Met Council I guess you'd say you know they have a desire to own everything and because they could do it so much better than everybody else even though it costs three times as much and doesn't provide anything but that's beside the point but uh, so it was a enjoyable re uh, meeting. All right. Hopefully we'll make some connections somehow. Good, Councilor Punt. Um, we have a Scott County Transit meeting actually tomorrow morning, Wednesday morning. Um, and then there was a Suburban Transit Authority meeting which Mr. Leak represented us at. If there were a couple points you would like to share, Mr. Leak. Um, sure, thank you, Councilor Punt. With respect to the Transit Review Board, one thing to be aware of is that the planning for the Marshall Road site is moving forward at the uh, transit planning team. We had an initial presentation by LSA about that and provided some input about it. So if you have questions about that, please let me know. Um, for the first time since that was initiated in 2005, we have a different chair of the staff committee. I finally was able to convince someone else to chair that meeting. Um, in terms of Suburban Transit Association, you may be aware that Representative Beard, who chairs the House Transportation Committee, convened a number of meetings to talk about the issues related to transit financing and transit management. And I, as well as other, several other Suburban Transit Association folks and other folks as well, attended those. Um, in addition, Representative Peggy Scott, who chairs the um, Legislative Commission on Metropolitan Governance has been a part of those discussions. And the long and short of that is that we have provided input to uh, Representative Beard and to Representative Scott's committee through testimony about potential proposals to separate out metropolitan transit operations from the Metropolitan Council, essentially leaving them with the long-term planning responsibility but um, I think the proposal that you'll see introduced probably in the next week or so would create a separate Metro Transit Authority um, to which Metropolitan Transit would um, respond uh, separate from the Metropolitan Council. There are likely to be at least a couple of bills um, related to governance. One of them is a larger picture one. It has certainly very little chance of moving forward this year because it's a short session. There are some smaller ones um, that may have more of a likelihood. In terms of financing, um, Suburban Transit Association had previously and will again introduce legislation for consideration that increases our share of MVEST as transit providers. You'll remember that when transit funds moved from the property tax to MVEST. The initial level was 21.5 percent and we all shared in that 21.5 percent. Um, but there was an escalator to 36 percent and so far the suburban transit providers have not shared in the growth of MVEST and MVEST right now is experiencing some growth. Uh, so that proposal will be under discussion. There are some other proposals that relate to what happened in terms of funding last year. Um, you're aware that Maple Grove essentially had all of its MFEST funding taken away. Um, their contention was that that was for capital purposes and a project for a park and ride that they were going to do was dependent on that. So there is legislation that's been introduced to allow them to share in state funding, fund, excuse me, bond funding to get that constructed. So that's some of the stuff that's been going on legislatively. All right, thank you. Um, and my report, we had um, on the 10th, we had a scale meeting where we introduced scales legislative uh, slate to our local legislators and it was very good. I'm not sure, did we get that out to council in the activity report? 
If not, can we? It's on the website, but we can certainly make copies of that. Sure. Right. Thank you. Um, and then uh, last Tuesday, Mr. McNeil and I met out at RAR and talked with um, them about what their future plans are and what they plan on uh, doing. And it was talked about quite a few things out there. It's a great facility, and they have uh, big plans for the C.H. Robinson um, lumberyard section there. And so that was really good to talk about what they are planning to do in the future and what an integral part they are to Shakopee um, on the west end over there. Uh, and then Councilor Whiting and I, for the last couple Thursdays, have been doing interviews for boards and commissions. Wind that up this Thursday. Um, we've had almost 30 interviews, people interview for things, and it's been great. We've been getting a lot of great ideas and people excited about working with the community, so I thank everybody for doing that. Um, and then lastly, last Thursday, um, a group of folks, including Mr. McNeil and I, myself, went to uh, TriStar and Faribault and toured. Um, TriStar is um, intended to move to Shakopee, and it's going to be such a wonderful company to have here. They do <coughs> a lot of really great things for their employees, and they are a very much um, the epitome of family-owned companies, and they do a really good job and will be a very welcome asset to Shakopee. So it's exciting to have those kinds of things happening. And uh, that's all I got. Item number 12, any other business? I'll just inform the council on March 6th. I have an out-of-state business commitment, so I won't be here. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. And everybody stand up at one. Well, I have to. <laughs> so moved by Councilor Punt. A second by Councilor Clay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? <clears throat> Meeting is adjourned at 9.03. Thank you much, everybody.